So, as advertised, I'll give you some highlights from Eurozeta. Here, I'll talk about Eurozeta bubbles, um, but also about some other things. Um, here is uh, Eurozeta. Um, so, I'll talk, first talk a little bit about the mission. Not everybody may be familiar with it. This is what the Spectrum RG mission looks like. It's got a platform and there's two telescopes mounted on it. There's ARTXC, it's a Russian instrument for hard X-rays, and Eurozeta, which is an instrument built by the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Munich. Um, it's the soft X-ray telescope up here. Uh, and um, so that's been built mainly by the MPE, and our role here in Hamburg is to do the mission planning for um, the, the whole survey. So this is, um, is our involvement in that. If you take off the cover from Eurozeta, you look down these seven telescopes. These are Volta-type X-ray telescopes. They've got 54 concentric shells in them, um, silicon wafers, and you see these battles here. Uh, on top of them, that's what uh, it looks like. It's parked out at L2 uh, in uh, the, uh, the mission, the, the, the telescope. It was launched in 2019. And uh, what it's going to do is rotating um, six times per day and um, thus scans the entire sky. So every Every six months, it will have covered the entire sky. Uh, and this, I mean, so it does this for four years, and so we'll complete eight all-sky surveys of it. And um, this is what it's been doing now after an initial phase of um, performance verification and all this. And currently, um, we're in the third survey now, which is currently going on. Um, Eurozeta is a survey instrument, so it's surveying uh, the sky, meaning it's got um, a large field of view. Here you see the field of view of XMM Newton here and Chandra, which um, are um, well known X ray workhorses still out in the sky. Here's the Eurozeta field of view. Uh, it uh, scans the sky in a scanning mode, so it'll, it'll scan this and then add some complications to the data analysis. As you can imagine, it's got a field of view of about 65 arc minutes. Um, here are some specs. So it's got seven mirrors in it. Um, you may be interested in what its um, PSF. So on axis, it's about 16 arc seconds, and it gets a little worse. This is the energy range, so a little wider than, than Rosa did. Um, there's some other things in it that may be interesting, maybe most, mostly the energy resolution which is about, um, uh, about 100 EV at 6 kV. Um, so these are some basic uh, specs of it. Um, unfortunately, the instrument, uh, the, the Russian and the German consortia that run uh, the instruments um, decided to split the sky in half. And um, don't get me started on this, um, but it actually turns out that um, uh, the German consortium um, has, is, is, has got the, the, the southern sky here, the Russian, the other part of the sky. Although, you know, just like the discovery of the EU Zeta bubble shows, um, there, are, there are a few joint um, um, companies and joint papers and joint projects. And hopefully that's going to be um, the rule more than the exception. And once it's completed, EU Zeta has completed eight, um, it's, it's eight service after four years. Uh, it will uh, be substantially lower in sensitivity here than existing surveys. You can see a plot of the area versus the flux limit here, and here you see the ERAS-8 um, limit. So it's going on to all sky, and it's almost two orders of magnitude better than existing surveys um, in there. So that's the parameter space you would like, that's the niche of this um, particular instrument. Um, the images that they get out after Eight surveys look a bit like an XMM Newton uh, observation uh, in here. That's uh, here's a comparison that was made by Miriam. Now let me get to the to the science highlights. Um, first, I'll talk about um, the Eurozeta bubbles. I actually wasn't part of that discovery, um, but maybe that's a good vantage point from where to give a little tutorial. Let me give you my view on it. Um, you've 
seen this image before. Uh, this is the 0.3 to 2.3 kV image here for Eusita. And what you can see is if you, if you see here the northern um, part of the bubble that was known before as, as Kartik set. What's new about uh, this paper is that the southern equivalent, you can see if you look at my cursor, the, the southern counterpart of this northern bubble, you can see here. And if you look, uh, what's also clearer from this image, clearer from what, uh, than from previous data, is how sharp this, this edge is, the northern edge is. And uh, so if you draw uh, a line over that, that image and you superimpose it on the radio image, it's spot on where the northern polar spur is located. Here is an old um, um, overlay of the radio synchron emission in that area. So this is, this looks a little bit like a, like a shock front that uh, is accelerating particles that you can see in radio synchron emissions. This a little bit reminds me uh, on these radio relics. So um, you you know this has a little bit of an equivalent in the extra galactic uh, sky, where here you've got features like this one's called the sausage relic, which is two megaparsecs in length and is also located at um, a um, at a shock wave of similar Mach number, actually of about 1.5, Mach number 1.5, that efficiently accelerates particles. So there's an interesting um, um, equivalent there, and it's not actually theoretically clear how such weak shocks can accelerate particles, electrons here in this case. Well, so what are we looking at? Um, people have talked at length about what could be the origin as well. Um, there is um, you know, some sort of hypershell located at the, at the galactic center, although it has been pointed out that the northern part is not, the northern polar spur is not really exactly centered on the galactic center, but more on the, on, on, on the Cygnus uh, center here. But the southern, the southern loop seems to be more centered on the galaxy. Also, and it's been remarked before that the, the, the base of the UZ is actually fairly wide. Uh, there as well. Um, here are the Fermi bubbles, and we just had a great uh, tutorial by Kartik about it, um, which is a bipolar structure that sits within the Eurozeta uh, bubbles. And then here you see a superposition of um, the, the gamma ray bubbles in here and uh, the Eurozeta bubbles here, here in blue. Um, like you see, the base is very wide. Um, interestingly, also, uh, there's a little bit of a like almost like a gap here, up here, if you can see this where my cursor is. Um, yeah, not quite clear what causes this gap, um, but it's a little bit curious that this gap also lies in a, in a place where there's a lot of NH. The column density of NH is quite large uh, in here. Again, I'd like to point out the sharpness here of this boundary, uh, which for people who are interested in shock acceleration, which is uh, what um, much of my my research revolves around is very exciting. Here's a little bit of a of of, of some numbers um, in here. Um, this is um, a figure taken from Peter Predale's paper, who I should actually mention he mentioned before. He is the lead author of this paper. In here, you see um, the uh, Fermi bubbles inside the larger Eurozeta bubbles here. Um, here are some tentative numbers taken from the, this paper uh, in here. Um, and you can look at some of these up. Interesting are the ages. The total thermal energy inside the UZ table is about 10 to the 56 ergs. So you can translate that into about 100,000 supernovae. And over that type of, uh, kind of age, that's about one supernova per 1,000 years. So it's not crazy uh, amount of supernovae that you need to, to fuel this. Uh, and um, in the paper, they do mention this 14 kiloparsec, so 7 kiloparsec radius of the Eurozeta bubbles, but um, I'll get to that a little bit. So what are still questions um, that we might also return to in the discussion session? One is how are Fermi and Eurozeta bubbles related? Is it the same thing, or were there two explosions, the northern polar spur, shockwave first, the Fermi bubbles later, uh, or was it a single event? Uh, or continuous periodic 
versus periodic energy release um, is caused by AGN or starbursts, and Kartik has already alluded to this. Also, there is, and there has been some comment in the Slack already, there's some dispute about the distance in here. Yeah, what do you see? It seems that the Fermi bubbles are driving the expansion of the bubble. The, the pressure inside the Eosita bubble appears to be fairly uniform, uh, which suggests that maybe there's not two processes in here, but there's, there's, there's one process that, that drives the entire bit. I've already alluded to, to uh, the gap. Uh, and um, Kati also met, already mentions the actual chimneys on a smaller scale at the base that um, might fuel uh, the Eosita bubbles uh, from the galactic center in as well. Now, a word about the distance. Um, an interesting paper came out very recently by La Rocca, and I know some people here in the meeting, uh, like Edmund, are part of this, um, have measured the distance to the northern, uh, northern polar spur using HaloSat. Now, for those of you who don't know what HaloSat is, HaloSat is a CubeSat, a six-unit CubeSat in here that measures X-ray spectra, and it has discovered two components um, that both belong to the northern polar spur in it, and um, the cool component here in these plots uh, is, is mentioned, is, is pictured in, in red, and the hot one here in black, and um, so these are the density profiles for, um, for a local a northern polar spur and for a distant one, uh, and so their paper suggests that uh, they're actually distant. Um, so about you know, 10 kpc um, distances of the northern polar spur. And this is in conflict with the paper that was uh, also just now um, pinned to the Slack, which is a paper by Daz and others. And they looked at um, Gaia and other surveys and, and looked at essentially the extinctions of stars in the northern polar spur and um, looked at X-ray absorption and, and, and dust models. And they say that it's, it's, it's much closer. So I'm not the right person to go and weigh in on this dispute, but it's I put it out there and people can go and discuss it uh, in depth. So um, that's, of course, uh, relevant. Um, you know, I, I think that the northern polar spur is where the Eurozeta bubbles are, but it's, it's not clear. I was going to mention something about the bubble sizes. Um, I think the bubble sizes in the in the paper for for the Eosita bubbles was actually misquoted. And that's because we're actually quite close to them, uh, right? So if you look at these bubbles from our vantage point in the solar system here, uh, you look up at these huge bubbles and you see them. You don't see them here, but the actual radius is actually much smaller uh, in here. So actually, the the real radius of the Eosita bubbles is about should be five or six kpc, not. Uh, seven, uh, like what says the paper. So I think the authors have actually pointed this out themselves to me. So it's not that I'm lecturing them about this. So um, yeah, so that's something to bear in mind. And there have been simulations of the Fermi bubbles, noted by Matteo and, and and Gianni by by Kartik and others, and and many more. I won't mention them all here, and uh, we could go and revisit that uh, as well. So those are. Um, uh, the Eurozeta bubbles, there's uh, more stuff to discuss. There's a lot of interesting magnetic structures uh, in, in that region um, on large scales. And this is something that I find very interesting. So we can talk about itself, this too. Let me go and, uh, and check the time. I think there's a bit of time to talk about something else, uh, that, what, that what, we, what we're doing with Eurozeta. It's, um, it's scanning the entire sky. Its main science driver is to go and find uh, 100,000 galaxy clusters for various things such as you know, dark energy probes and, uh, and the likes. Uh, one of the things that uh, we found very recently that's relevant to people interested in gauge halos is um, is to look at for AGN feedback uh, and in groups. And um, Marisa Bienza, who's um, led this work, she uh, found. Uh, almost like a, a low mass equivalent of M87 or the Virgo cluster. We see here on the right is the, um, in the Eurozeta map and the, the blue stuff is, is, is radio emission here. On the, left, on the right hand side you see 
radio emission uh, from low far at 144 megahertz. And you see, you almost like you have this a torus that has gone up almost like a smoke ring and has um, survived actually for quite a long time. And it seems to be almost like a, a copy of the Virgo cluster, only at smaller, um, at smaller masses. So the first, um, this, this is, comes, has come out of the first catalog that we are analyzing, analyzing at the moment with 11,000 clusters and groups in them. And of course, most of the stuff that usually defines is, is groups, stuff that hasn't been found before. Uh, and there's, there's very many of them. And you can ask me about some of the physics um, later. Another um, science highlight from the mission itself concerns um, the WIM, so the warm, hot intergalactic medium that is searched, you know, that's contains the most, the largest part of the, the baryons uh, that sit in, in filaments that collect galaxy clusters. So one of the very early performance verification observations before the, the survey started in earnest, um, we pointed it to um, a pair of galaxy clusters, about 3395, 3396, and looked for whether there was warm, warm gas in between these clusters in the filaments um, in there as well. So this is the old Rosad image of uh, this pair of galaxy clusters has been actually well studied. Um, there's also Planck uh, data uh, about it, various types of S Z data and other bits. And um, so this was one of the, the targets here as well, this work led by Thomas Ripley from the University of Bonn that looked at this. And they found that there's a, a three megaparsic wide bridge connecting those gas clusters. They're about um, three megaparsecs apart. And you see here, they found evidence for warm gas, um, you know, 0.2 kV gas in here using the soft response of Eurozeta. And this has been um, published and um, I can refer people to this. So that's that's uh, interesting to see, um, you know, what is the thermostate of this. Um, we also looked at this actually in the radio and looked at what um, what we can learn about magnetic fields and um, and and electrons uh, there as well. And finally, there's also a bridge in um, in the coma cluster that's been seen. So there's also a bridge um, between galaxy clusters that you can see here. So this is some of the very early science highlight, uh, highlights that are already published with the Rosita. Um, spanning all the way from the Milky Way out to distant galaxy clusters. There's a whole other group here, the observatory and, 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 and elsewhere, that looks at, um, at um, coronal mass stars. About 20% of all Eurozeta sources are stars, um, coronally active stars. And that's uh, that's uh, the thing that people have looked at, at it. So let me go and try and wrap up to kick off uh, the discussion session. So Eurozeta has been going on now strong for about a year now and is performing uh, all sky surveys, um, meeting all the specification. It's all working uh, quite well. Uh, currently it's in the third of a total of eight all sky surveys. Uh, and um, I mentioned some highlights and that's one of the Eurozeta bubbles. And the other one is the warm, hot intergalactic medium in emission uh, and, and things like this. Now, they're relevant, uh, I think, for this workshop, and that we can uh, take that up in the discussion session, is first of all, uh, finding more than 100,000 gas clusters and groups, study AGN feedback in, in galaxies, in nearby galaxies, but also distant galaxies, for instance, by stacking galaxies, another project that we are preparing uh, and to look for um, warm hot intergalactic medium and filaments and the lux. And I think I'll I'll stop here and I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Marcus. That was great. Um, well, I'll start it off. Uh, when when is the um, well? It looks like uh, I'm interested in stacking of galaxies. Uh, when when is the ERAS one All Sky Survey going to be released, or when will you be able to stack galaxies and look for right, yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. So unfortunately, Rosita is um, is um, is a proprietary mission in the sense that there's always a lot of there's a lot of political debate and 
lot of typical negotiation going on when to release the data, as there's obviously different views in the different consortia that are involved. But um, it's yeah, but um, it's been agreed that um, ERAS one is going to be um, is going to be um, released in about eighteen months from now. So the the the, 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 the service that are going to be made public is ERAS one, ERAS four, and ERAS eight, and every single one of them is going to be made public about eighteen months after the last photon I think has come in. Or has been calibrated, so there's some uh, dispute about this, but uh, that's roughly the timeline of when the data is going to be public. And yes, so we've been looking at uh, stacking galaxies, um, comparing it also to SZ stacked uh, galaxies and trying to find the CGM. And um, yeah, um, I think there's a lot of work that can be done. Um, trying to bin them in different ways, select them in different ways, compare them to you know, whatever is out there. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and yeah, and then go in you know, the all sky from both consortia, uh, all the data is then going to be public. And um, so, yeah, so that's exciting. I mean, for Rosat, as you know, that was that flew sometimes in the 80s. It took decades <laughs> to mine all that data. And uh, yeah, of course, now already we've got many more photons um, on disk than, than both have ever found. And um, Annalisa wants to know about when is the science verification phase going to be released? Ah, that's very soon. Uh, um, and um, that's, um, I think, in April, May or something, is the last I heard. Okay. Well, let's um, let's open up the. Let's see. I don't see any. Do I see any hands raised? I don't. Um, we will. Um, let's do five more minutes of questions, um, and then we'll go out to uh, go to the uh, take a break, and have um, those who want to go join um, the further the breakout session uh, go to the Erosita plus Fermi bubble room. Right. Yeah. Good. Yes. If people have um, interesting comments about the debate of the distance, um, about any other thermal, non-thermal um, aspect of it, you know, go shoot. Um, well, I can keep on going. Uh, oh no. Okay, we got some questions here. Um, let's with, go with uh, Christoph. Um, Hi, Marcus. Very interesting Hi. talk. So, I'm actually a, bit, a little bit puzzled because I attended a workshop years ago on the gamma ray sky, and there the sort of conclusion was that the North Pole is a local thing. But now, reading the Erosita paper and others, the jury is still open, basically. So, what is sort of the best observational evidence for a local phenomenon? And what is sort of the best observational evidence for a sort of uh, galactic center related phenomenon. I'm not the right person to ask. Other people can weigh in, but the most recent strong claim for a local origin comes from the DAS 2020 paper that I also, there's all my slides somewhere. Uh, and I can, I can look it up. And um, the most recent uh, evidence for the local evidence is the La Roca 2020 paper. Um, but of course, both these uh, points of view have got a long history, uh, which I haven't even attempted to go and uh, all put out here. Um, there's um, other people so, who can... Chris, uh, Christoph, to summarize, I think uh, the, all the X-ray emission or absorption models are saying this is galactic center phenomena. All the polarization maps are saying that it is local phenomena. So. This is what I recently realized. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, let's get Mark's question. Dust the theory of dust. <laughs> okay, let's get Mark's question in there too. Uh, yeah, and, and, and maybe this will carry us into the breakout room. But um, many of us would like to know whether this is supernova driven or AGN driven. <laughs> and 
Uh, those are fighting words in certain communities that are passionate about the Fermi bubbles. So instead of asking you to take a side, I, I guess uh, it'd be nice to, and I know Kart Kartik did some of this, but um, what uh, observations are most determinative um, in, in, in trying to distinguish which, what the source of the bubbles is? Um, and if, if those observations, uh, if you would love to see some observations made that are not, have not yet been made, it would be good for this community to know. Yeah, I think it'd be good to hear from maybe from people who simulated this uh, to say what, what could be the best diagnostics. Uh, I, I think that the main difference between the star function and the AGN-driven models uh, is that the AGN-driven models seem to be like, one thing is that the luminosity of the AGN-driven model, which is uh, one thing that, you know, probably very high luminosity models are excluded by the uh, oxygen eight to seven line ratios. But even at the low, low, lower luminosity regime, right, 10 to minus four, 10 to minus five, uh, LA Dington, uh, there is very, it is very hard to distinguish between this uh, two star supernovae and the uh, low luminosity AGN. One thing that can um, actually do that is that find a temperature variation across the uh, Fermi bubble in the X-ray. So in AGN driven cases, you would have more kinetic energy towards the vertical direction than uh, you know, uh, uh, the star function driven case. So in star function driven case, this uh, temperature would be more uniform. It doesn't, uh, it, will, it should not vary across latitude, but in AGN driven case, you would see a uh, greater variation across the Fermi bubble. Uh, because of the kinetic energy injected vertically. Uh, so this is one of the uh, observations that probably, I don't know, I'm not sure if it is doable. Okay, on that note, um, let's, all, let's all take a, uh, a, a break here um, because it's been a very intense uh, conversation or very active conversation. Um, and um, come back here in nine minutes for uh, the... Uh, how to deblend the Milky Way ISM from the CGM. Uh, and you can migrate over to the, uh, um, to the breakout room for the bubbles. Um, but I would say let's, let's force ourselves to have a little bit of a break. Um, <laughs>